They're gonna kill the love of my life. Casey! If I don't go back to what I was doing. Our line of work is quite brutal and quite ruthless. How far would you go for love? You steal truck, bring it to me. Then you make your money. Is it dangerous? Of course it's dangerous! Nicholas Holt, Felicity Jones, with Ben Kingsley and Anthony Hopkins. All this trouble, all this pain, for love. Collide, now playing. Rated PG-13, may be inappropriate for children under 13. Blog Talk Radio. Good morning. You've reached Venus Unplugged, your virtual Hopbrook Hotel. This is Lorraine Nighthart, your host. And what we do here is we talk about all things Venusian. The shadow, the light, the up, the down, the archetypes, uh, the forces. Because Venus, she's not just a planet. She's a very powerful archetype. An archetype is a universal pattern of consciousness. And uh, today, what I'd like to look at or explore, since uh, the world has given birth symbolically, mythologically, or through dreams of the divine child within, the holy spark that happens at the depth of the winter, and uh, that spark sometimes is very, very bright, and sometimes it's just itsy-bitsy. But we can cultivate it. We can discover what that spark is about. Now, the archetype of the divine child, okay? So we can have an aspect of the divine child, because in all mythologies and stories of saints and sinners and gods and goddesses, there's always something unusual about their birth, right? So that lets us know when we have a motif of a birth, something's happening. So the divine child uh, is, of course, a universal symbol and an archetype, but it also uh, is an aspect within ourselves. And we can be very aware of the wounded side of the divine child the boo-boos we get here on earth. Now, those boo-boos are great teachings. And, uh, you know, actually no one can heal them but ourselves. It's, it's as if that's how the story that once upon a time begins. We're, we're born into an uh, environment. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And there is a wound, and that wound... That's the beginning. That's the aha moment. That's the, one of the purposes. So we work a lot here with, uh, you know, my, my gift. I was born a, a psychic. And uh, I was born with the gift. I wasn't born a psychic. You know, I was born with this gift, which was a lot of pain until um, fate arranged for a series of meetings and a few near-death experiences to have me kind of come up to the plate. So this divine child that we all had a little spark of yesterday, or we could have felt the wound. You know, we could have felt like, oh, I don't have any presents. So what do we do? We give ourselves a present or we make ourselves something. But I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give ourselves, particularly for this coming year, all right, 2013 prepared us for 2014, all right? 2014 is really going to be uh, a lot about initiation and growth and so on, things and events that happened this year, uh, like with me, you know, the death of my beloved cat, Faith, which I now refer to as the grief whispers because I'm learning so much about, I mean, I've had a lot of grief in my life, but this one really this one really, really opened me up to a level of love I didn't know I was capable of, and a level of pain too. And in that, and in that pain, when you choose neither love nor pain, uh, but what co- is going on in between? Okay, we begin to understand things. So this divine child. So if you didn't give yourself a little present uh, yesterday, please do that today. Do something that you really love. Not you, but the little one within. 
because the little one within is actually the one who is connected to the whole universe because the archetype of the divine child is not just ourselves in childhood. But what I want to look at, because we're going to need to really work with this, if you so choose, because it's all about free will, and the way of Venus and her beloved son, Eros, that's the essence of love. Eros is the principle that brings two things together, the relatedness. All right. So, and the opposite of love is power. So, do you want to be right or do you want to be related to? Very often, when we when we have a deep need to relate, it is not important to be right. I've always wondered that. It's like, so who gives a shit if you're right? You're ruining the party. Okay, and usually. When we get on our right, righteous ride, okay, if, if, if we have a truth, we have a truth. But when we get real righteous about it or somebody's getting righteous about it, they're usually possessed by the negative uh, animus. Okay. Uh, I have it on the highest authority. Yeah, what? And it would be good, particularly this coming year, is to question your beliefs. Where did you get them from? You know, sometimes we have a whole bunch of beliefs that uh, we, we just took in from the environment. I mean, they really don't even work for who we are, but we accept. All right, so it's good to lovingly question, why do I believe this? When did I begin to believe this? Does this work now for me? Have I outgrown this? Okay, so that's going to be very important. Uh, for the for this upcoming well, for our lives too, to question, not attack, not interrogate, question. Wow, where did I first begin to believe that? Right? Because today uh, I'm going to look at the the archetype of the trickster. So this is the work of Carl Jung, and in dreams and in life a trickster will come. And usually a trickster will show up just for the sheer hell of it, okay? Um, but also when we're getting too rigid, something will happen, that its opposite will take place. Or, uh, you know, you just meet somebody who's really kind of hot, and you say, oh, I just want to wrap my arms around you, but instead you say, oh, I just want to wrap my legs around you. It's like, wow. Okay, now is that a Freudian slip or a Jungian truth? I think it's a Jungian truth. That's what I call them. It's like, whoa, Psyche spoke. You got to stand by Psyche. Too bad if you're embarrassed. She had to say what she had to say. Now, the archetype of the trickster, it's, it's like a parallel figure to one's the individual shadow. The shadow is what we don't know about ourselves. The shadow isn't necessarily negative. It's, it feels negative to the ego because the ego thinks it's too cool for school. You know, okay, the, the ego is like, no, this is who I am. And the shadow goes, yeah, well, maybe today you are, but in truth you're not. Uh, uh, there's more richness and imagination and forces in the shadow. And there's more of what we don't know about ourselves than what we do know about ourselves. Okay? When we can approach any of this, right? this is a lifetime work. This is like a philosophy. This is a way of looking at things. And we really, I mean, part of the Venus Unplugged here is to begin to explore these things because, you know, as the divine feminine in men and women in the world, um, she's really rising. And that doesn't mean matriarch over patriarch because that's, that's old and that's over and done with. We're much more creative than that. Uh, it's these tremendous forces. And uh, the divine feminine can be the loving, absolutely loving and comfortable, or she can be fierce and terrifying, as all archetypes can be. So we're all up for... Uh, Having our eggs scrambled in 2014, 
and uh, we need if it has meaning, we can deal with it, right? So, the archetype of the trickster it's a parallel figure to the individual shadow, and the trickster is a sort of a collective shadow. Uh, it's like the figure of the clown, okay? And it is inferior, in a sense, all right? The summation of the inferior or unrecognized traits of character in individuals. Like, oh, well, I would never do that. It's like, meanwhile, every child and stranger uh, knows you're perfectly capable of doing that. Okay, uh, so Jung characterizes the trickster as an archetypal aspect of the shadow. However, it soon becomes apparent when working with tricksters uh, that they do not follow the gender patterns of the shadow. Sometimes women uh, have male tricksters and men have female tricksters. Sometimes women have male tricksters and men have the female tricksters and vice versa. Now, usually in a, in a dream... All right. When a shadow figure comes up, it's the same gender as the dreamer. So a woman will dream of like a really meany woman or a really, you know, we can have a golden shadow. It can be somebody that can do something that we think we're absolutely incapable of doing. It could be a shadow figure. All right. But the trickster, hence the word trickster, can come either way. All right. Uh, the name trickster... Uh, leads to the main way that they can be spotted. They play tricks. Fate plays tricks is a common experience. Uh, and as I said, like 40 and trips, uh, like I just 40 and trips. See, I just did it. My psyche spoke for me. Uh, 40 and tricks, Jungian truths, All right? Uh, so when we, when we misstate or mishear something or we lose things or forget things, Usually at what seems the worst possible time, Jung's archetypal studies of the trickster figures illuminate the meaning of these personal tricksters. You know, everybody knows the trickster. Okay, you're ready, you're leaving, you're in your car, you're in the bus, whatever the hell, wherever you're going, okay? And this voice says, you know, did you leave the stove on? That's the trickster. Now, sometimes... The trickster, it, it wants you to reverse something, to go back, to stop the day, to go back, to, to uh, a ripple in time. It has a purpose. It's not random, because everything in the universe is meaningful. Mm -hmm. So the organizing arch archetype of the trickster is behind uh, fools and jesters and clowns and scapegoats and devils and the god Pan and a myriad of other images of folly. And the trickster has been observed in uh, myth cycles of all people in medieval carnivals. I don't know those who have ever seen or heard of the fool's mass, where everything is reversed. Okay. And um, the holy, the priests, uh, they become the parishioners or, you, you know, the manhouse, the people who are experiencing life in a different dimension. Uh, in the madhouse, they come and they 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 reside over the altar and uh, the sacraments, and uh, the priests become the mad people. All these reversals, usually things we laugh at a lot because we know the reversal. Uh, so, and in al alchemical figures such as as Hermes or Mercury's, and in fairy tales, and in comedy routines throughout history, is the trickster. But Saturn also, you know, because we're having this, well, Saturn is always important because Saturn really gives us, uh, really, Saturn really teaches us that we stand on sacred ground. You know, it, it, it really does. It's, it's the taskmaster without a shadow of a doubt. I call it stuffing lentils. I go, okay, Sad, no problem. You want me to just take this pile of seeds and stuff them with something else? Okay, fine. Detail, detail. But while you're stuffing your lentils, Saturn is working it out for you. Do you ever wonder where old problems go? They get resolved. Where do they go? That's always amazing to me. So the trickster, the trickster, Saturn will work with this trickster because in, in the dream time, 
it will trick us into asking another question of ourselves or will trick us into seeing something in another way, right? Sometimes it can just be a mean trick to let you know the person's a bully and don't be friends with them. So Jung has uh, identified a number of, of kind of typical trickster motifs and traits, such as a fondness for sly jokes and malicious pranks. Those always get me nervous. Uh, the power of a shapeshifter. A dual nature. You'll, you'll have a dream or uh, act of imagination of a half animal, half divine. And exposure to all kinds of, of uh, strange experiences. Okay. Uh, and the trickster has a low level, sometimes it can feel like a low level of intelligence because it does things on such a primitive level. It doesn't mean that it's stupid. Trickster is not stupid. Just working at a, on a different level of communication, okay? And the trickster can kind of reduce the world around him into chaos. It's not necessarily him, around it to chaos. When you have one of those really chaotic dreams, the trickster is ruling. So then we have to say, okay, what is this pointing to? What's the thread in the chaos? Or oh, the chaos in the external world. Step back. Write it out. Draw a picture. Look at it. See, what is, what is the identifying thread? It's not important to be right at this moment. Truth will always prevail if you have the right question. The question is the most important. That's why I say, you know, question, why do I believe this? You may find out you don't believe it anymore, or you just accepted it. Or it's not truth, whatever that may be. So uh, the trickster can play malicious jokes on people, only to fall victim in turn to his own vengeance of those who he has injured. We love movies like that and stories like that. It's like, ha, ha, good. See, put himself in peril or herself in peril for his life. His behavior is unpredictable with senses orgies of destruction, and self-imposed suffering. And there's some people who just, they're, they're just tricksters by nature. And then, you know, falling in love with a trickster, man, that's a, that's a deep comic wounded pattern hurt. Because they just, the truth is the lie and the lie and the truth. They can't help themselves. It's truly their nature. And you know it because you get discombobulated. You never quite know. And it's like, wow, they are possessed by a trickster archetype, and you observe it. You don't believe them. You just watch. You know, it's, uh, some people can walk in and bring such a sense of that we're standing on sacred ground, we're here upon the earth, uh, and other people walk in, and it's sheer chaos. And it's like, no, 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 no. And some people like to be in chaos. I'm not one of them. Okay. So in proving um, or in probing the meaning of an archetype, uh, Jung says one can never look at the historical so sources, okay, but must also look to the function of the archetype. What can the purpose or meaning of this crude, primitive identity be in modern times? Young says the trickster forms a picture of a much earlier level of development, being dragged along in modern times as a senseless part of us, but that its presence felt on the highest level of civilization indicates the trickster is more than a historical remnant. All right, in its earliest state, is dying usually uh, lose their energy and disappear, but not the trickster. Since the trickster remains, it is evidently serves a purpose now. So the culture moves along, and uh, we forget certain things, like dinosaurs. We outgrow them. We don't need them anymore. They go someplace else, okay? But the memory uh, 
resides, okay? And in this case, the, I mean, the trick, trickster and the dinosaur have nothing to do with one another per se. But that we need the archetype of the trickster, and that's why it comes up in such raw power. Huh. Pranksters aren't great sophistication or great feats of uh, higher intelligence. They're primitive, which also makes them funny because they're so raw. Uh, but some pranks are not funny, okay? So the historical approach is shown is that the, tr the, the trickster, you know, uh, is like a higher level of consciousness has covered up a lower one. Jung asked the question, what happens to these lower qualities when people become more civilized? They become jokes, okay? He answers that they have gone up in smoke but have merely withdrawn from the unconscious. See, that is the amazing, amazing thing about all of us. We are constantly in a, in a vast sea of conscious and unconscious, moving, evolving, regressing, dropping in, dropping out. So even the most enlightened conscious person on this planet is just, just a pinhead of consciousness. There's always so much more. Well, we certainly won't get bored, all right? So these primitive... Uh, forces, as we shall call them, architects, they go back into the unconscious, but then they show up again, okay? Usually, well, we don't really need it. Everything in, in psyche has a purpose. There's nothing idle. There's no oops. Didn't really mean that. No, you didn't mean to get caught. That's what you, what you didn't mean, okay? So until consciousness finds itself in a critical or doubtful situation, the trickster waits looking for a favorable opportunity to reappear as a projection on a neighbor, or Jung sees a great threat to civilization in having forgotten the dangers of the trickster. So this is a quote from Uncle Carl. The so-called civilized man has forgotten the trickster. He remembers him only figuratively and metaphorically when irritated by his own ineptitude. He speaks of fate playing tricks on him or of things being bewitched. He never suspects that his own hidden and apparently harmless shadow has qualities whose dangerousness exceeds the wild, his wildest dreams. As soon as people get together in masses and submerge the individual, the shadow is mobilized and, as history shows, may even be personified and incarnated. Well, I think that's one of the reasons we can have war. Or we can get one people to go against another people. Right. So Jung says that the dangerous shadow is ignored or forgotten, and then people fall into the error of uh, they thinking, you know, that they're like too cool, okay, perfect order, and, and that only their material deprivation is the problem, and that the meaning of existence is food and clothing and, and diamonds and automobiles and computers and all that stuff. As a result, as individuals, uh, we lose the capacity for introspection, and we rely on external environments. Well, isn't that true of what's going on now? So a personal code of ethics is replaced by laws, leaving, for example, uh, soldiers who've never, sub you know, soldiers who will just take orders. They, don't, they won't question it. Well, the corporate man, well, that's what we do. Yeah, why do you do it? You just destroyed, you know, 5,000 lives. Okay. So Jung says that an individual in such a condition has not yet made the discovery that he might be capable of spontaneous ethical impulses and of performing them, even when no one is looking. This leads Jung to the meaning and purpose of the trickster myth. The opposite of the trickster is the hero. So let's say in a dream, when you need some ego strength, you know, when you're really feeling like, oh, I don't know if I could do this thing called life, it's really getting to me. A hero will show up in your dreams. 
Now, even if you don't remember your dreams, that's all right. It's still happening. All right, or we may we may see it in a in a movie, or we may read about it. It will get activated. All right, and the opposite of that is the trickster. Okay, so from the point from this point of view, we can see why the myth of the trickster was prescribed, preserved, and developed. Like many other myths, it was supposed to have a therapeutic effect. It hurdles. Uh, uh, It holds the earlier low intellect and moral level before the eyes of the more highly developed individual so that he shall not forget how things looked yesterday. There but for the grace of God go I. And the best stories, once again, you know, of choosing uh, relatedness over truth, if you tell a story, if you know somebody's going through something, I'll use myself as an example, um, and I'll tell a story, something about my life, okay? And it's like a teaching story because I can relate to how one felt in that moment or how one silly felt or how one did something just dumbass, okay? But then you recognize, like, holy moly, I really did that. And hopefully you grow, all right? So the tricks to figure by the very tricks he plays, points to potential disaster, which in itself is an increase in consciousness. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The trickster figure within us, okay, or we can we can see it in movies or plays, literature, okay? Uh, we see it a lot in children's books. There's always that trickster. You go like, uh-oh. I'm not following them. They're going to get. They're going to trick me to get into trouble, or sometimes they trick us to uh, see something that that we couldn't see. Mm. So the tricks to figure, by the very tricks he plays, points to the potential disaster, which in itself is an increase in consciousness. The trickster raises the problem and asks the question, and will not allow them to be ignored. He is thus the first step towards finding solutions and answers. So we can call on the trickster within ourselves. So how, how could I look at this in a different way? Um, there was a, a, a woman who I've been mentoring for a number of years, and at this point in life she was having a very, very difficult time. She couldn't get out of her way because so much stuff. I mean, she was, you know, she was caught in the trickster. So there was no, no intellectual or no, you know, really kind of logical or intellectual exercise. So I suggested that she take a day and she do everything in reverse. You have your dinner at breakfast. Everything that you would normally do, you just say, I'm going to do its opposite. You know, if you're normally a neat person, it's like, so just let it all fall down that day. When you start reversing, you start getting a sense, because the trickster is going to reverse it anyway, so you might as well go on the side of the trickster for a little while and start pointing out. I remember many years ago, and I was deeply devoted to the addiction to perfection. It was like, oh, how exhausting. And... uh, my ceiling in my entranceway, in my apartment, began to crack. And something said, you're not allowed to fix it until you accept it. Every time I look at that thing, I went out of my mind. I had to leave it crack like that for two years until I could accept it. So that was a trickster quality. It was giving me something that was tricking me into just accepting. Shit happens, ceilings fall, all sorts of things take place. So uh, the Queen's telling me I've got like a few seconds. So uh, once again, Lorraine Neidhart, 212-757-8914. And I think we've got a little more talking about the trickster. I think this can be very, very helpful to all of us. Have an absolutely glorious New Year. Um, perhaps instead of those lists for the new year, just make a devotion to 
to something, one thing you'll be devoted to. Like, you're not going to resist who you truly are. You can be tricked, and a lot of times in consciousness, we're tricked into consciousness. We're going one way, and spirit is taking us another, and voila, suddenly, there we are on our way to wholeness. So have a glorious New Year's, and I'll talk to you next Thursday. Bye-bye.